As has been mentioned at the beginning of the service today, with Pastor Ollie not being able to be with us today, um, I will be reading the message that he has prepared, uh, and it is based on the two of the readings that we had today, the one from Isaiah um, 11, chapter 11, verses 1 to 10, and also the Luke 1, verses 26 to 38 reading. It's entitled, God's Promise of Hope, and let me just pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we just pray for your spirit to be amongst us today, that this message of hope can be shared without being hindered. May it reach our hearts and our lives and remind us of the hope that we have in you. Amen. God's promise of hope. It's amazing what you can get through if you have just a little hope. On December the 22nd, 1991, James Scott, who was a 20-year-old, 24-year-old medical student, went mountain climbing in the Himalayas in Nepal, but unfortunately was caught in a snowstorm. Somehow he found shelter under a ledge where he had spare clothes, a sleeping bag and two chocolate bars. His family hired a search helicopter but they failed to find him for weeks. On February the 3rd, 1992, searchers found him alive but almost blind after 43 days. James looked forward to being with his fiance and his family again, and it was this hope that kept him alive. Hope is the anticipation of something good in the future. At this time of the year, children are hoping for Christmas presents. Parents and grandparents are hoping for family gatherings, and most of us may be hoping for a few days off. Would you agree that hope is powerful? Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. They say, where there is life, there is hope. And it works just as well the other way around. Where there is hope, there is life. But without hope, difficult days and dire circumstances can grind us into despair, dread and depression. Hopelessness is a symptom of being cut off from our true source of life, the living God. As Paul reminds his friends at Ephesus that they were once without hope and without God in the world. We all need hope to make it through life's hardships. People in drought hope for rain. People inundated by floods hope the rain will stop. People in war-torn countries hope for peace. The oppressed or the exploited hope for justice and people facing death need hope for eternal life. So how is it for you? What is your source of hope in the face of defeat, disaster or death? A crisis always tests our source of hope. What do you hang on to when it all hits the fan? Who or what do you turn to when the present is dark and the future ahead looks bleak? If you're ever in that situation, then the prophet Isaiah has something for you. The prophet Isaiah burst onto the scene in Jerusalem around 740 BC till 686 BC. David's dynasty had been in steady decline already for over 200 years. Following Solomon's compromise with idols, the nation of Israel split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom, Judah. And these two kingdoms were often at loggerheads. Both kingdoms were sandwiched between two superpowers, Egypt in the southwest and Assyria in the northeast. While Egypt was struggling to retain its superpower status at the time, Assyria's star was on the rise, invading new clans, conquering their peoples and demanding goods and taxes. In 724 BC, the Assyrian king Shalmaneser invaded the northern kingdom, held Samaria under siege and sacked the capital in 721 BC. Enacting Assyrian policy, he re relocated its people to other countries and resettled the region with foreigners from other lands. Kings of the southern kingdom of Judah, Ahaz and his son Hezekiah, initially paid tribute to Assyria to prevent further incursions into their territory. 
But then one day, Hezekiah stopped, hoping that the Assyrians wouldn't notice. Did you think they noticed? Of course they did. So in 701 BC, King Sennacherib of Syria came to attack the fortified towns of Judah and conquered them. His attention then turned to Jerusalem, and in the NIV study Bible, it has this footnote. In his annals, Sennacherib claims to have captured 46 of Hezekiah's fortified cities, as well as numerous open villages, and to have taken 200,146 people captive. He says he made Hezekiah a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. But it doesn't say that he took Jerusalem. With the brutal Assyrians at his doorstep, Hezekiah attempts to buy off Sennacherib with 10 tons of silver and a ton of gold, hoping he would withdraw. Sennacherib, of course, took the money, but didn't leave. That's the problem with bullies, they're never satisfied. Sennacherib really wants to conquer Jerusalem. So imagine you fled with your family from a country village to Jerusalem, seeking shelter and protection inside its walls. An army of 185,000 Assyrian warriors is approaching and its general is giving an ultimatum to your leaders. Surrender or we will smash you to pieces, just like we've done to all the other nations. Where do you think you find hope in such circumstances? Well, King Hezekiah prays to the Lord. He prays for deliverance and consults the prophet Isaiah about the Assyrian threat. The Lord makes it clear that Assyria's days are numbered. Isaiah 10:12 says, after the Lord has used the king of Assyria to accomplish his purposes on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, he will turn against the king of Syria and punish him for he is proud and arrogant. Again, in Isaiah 10, 33, we hear, but look, the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies will chop down the mighty tree of Assyria with great power. He will cut down the proud. The lofty tree will be brought down. God says he will cut the Assyrians down to size, and he did. In 2 Kings 19.35, we read, The angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. So much for Assyria. But what hope is there for Israel after this, their devastation? God gives Isaiah a second vision of a better things ahead. In God's plans, his people have a hope and a future, and it all hinges on a descendant of David. As we heard in our reading today from Isaiah 11, one to three, out of the stump of David's family, we will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. Although David's dynasty was now just a stump, Isaiah declares that at some point in the future, a descendant of David will make everything that's wrong in the right in the world right again. It says the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, and that's what happened at Jesus' baptism. In Jesus' ministry, we see the power of the Holy Spirit to work miracles and to transform people's lives. Jesus amazes people with his teaching, his compassion, and his acts of service. With a word of command, Jesus has authority over disease, death, demons, and the destructive forces of nature. In Jesus' miracles, Isaiah's vision comes to life. It's an appetizer to the banquet when Jesus returns. Since this son of David will delight in obeying the Lord, he will make right judgments. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. 
And this is good news for the oppressed. And this son of David will punish the wicked by the authority of his word. The earth will shake at the force of his word and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. Just as we see in Jesus' miracles, his word will accomplish exactly what he says, which of course echoes Genesis 1. His rule will bring cosmic peace. Isaiah's vision is that all of creation will be healed and will be whole. No more invading armies threatening God's people with death and destruction. No more floods, storms, hurricanes, tsunamis or earthquakes. No more plagues or pandemics. Everyone will be safe from dangerous animals. In fact, it will be so safe that babies and toddlers will be able to play with snakes. The Old Testament scholar, Dr. Barry Webb, comments, it's a picture of the whole of creation put back into joint. The entire earth, not just Zion, will be where the Lord's holy mountain is. In other words, he will be known and his rule will be experienced everywhere. Isaiah's vision is a return to the paradise that God intended at the beginning. And we're told that a descendant of David will usher this in. And of course, that descendant is Jesus, and Jesus is our hope. So how does God keep this promise? For a start, we know that the shoot from the stump of David's family is Jesus. It's there in Angel's announcement to Mary that we also heard this morning in Luke chapter 1. As the angel says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give you the throne of his ancestor, David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So firstly, our hope is in Jesus' promises. Some think it's arrogant to say that we are confident of inheriting eternal life. But I submit to you that it's not arrogant to acknowledge that we mess up and that's why we need Jesus to save us. It's also not arrogant to trust Jesus' promises. Promises like that he's given us in John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And another that he gives in John 5, 24. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. Jesus has defeated death for us. He shares his victory and life with everyone who will put their hope in him. The proof of that he will keep this promise is in his own resurrection. Since no one else has beaten death, it makes sense to put our hope in Jesus. Secondly, hope in Jesus transforms our lives. Friends, our future hope and destiny shapes our everyday lives. As Paul writes to Titus, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed in turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. And thirdly, Jesus will vindicate our hope. Jesus' first coming was in humility, but his second coming will be coming in glory. We regularly confess that Jesus is coming again to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. Do we believe it? Isaiah's vision will be fulfilled at Jesus' second coming. In the meantime, we will face struggles, trials, setbacks and heartaches. Yet, we persevere with hope because it rests securely in Jesus. 
No matter what you're going through or how you feel or what's going on in the world, God will keep his promise. And we live and die with hope in Jesus, knowing that the best is still to come. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2.9, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So, as it says in Psalm 31.24, Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Amen.